Welcome to Beyond Blueprints. I'm Andrew Smith, and today we're delighted to be joined by Tian Nguyen, who's a senior systems engineer at Universal Hydrogen. So great to have you with us, Tian. And I want to kick straight into it. Um, you know, I, I read up a little bit on Universal Hydrogen, and I've heard that you are the Nespresso capsules for hydrogen. Uh, one, is that a fair reflection? And two, what is Universal Hydrogen setting out to do? I think that's a very fair reflection, right? It, it reflects what our what we hope our market case to be. And Universal Hydrogen, it's it's a bit in the name. Uh, we're looking to, to center our market around uh, selling hydrogen capsules specifically for the aviation industry, right? So when you talk about trying to uh, work sustainability into something like aviation, there's a lot of talk about, you know, big infrastructure changes. How do you get giant pipes of whether it's liquid hydrogen or SAFs or things like that? onto airports, which is like a big daunting task that involves, you know, city governments, counties, federal governments, a lot of things. Um, so Universal Hydrogen is looking to kind of work into that um, area by creating these modular uh, hydrogen capsules, right? Because you get so much loss uh, just in the transfer of this gas because it's the smallest, uh, very energy dense once you can get it into its liquid state, but it also likes to escape because it's a very small molecule. So you get a lot of transfer losses if you're talking about, you know, piping it in from somewhere and it has to go into a tank and then piping it out of the tank into a, an aircraft. So we, we're trying to solve those issues by having these modular hydrogen capsules that you can just load on and off standard cargo door um, into aircraft. And along with that, uh, as part of the group that I work with, you also need, obviously, a new powertrain that can accept this hydrogen um, fuel. Right. So you can't run. Well, not yet anyway. Uh, you can't run the, the typical turboprop on a, a hydrogen engine. So we have um, electric fuel cell powertrains that we're putting together as convergence kits um, to sell out to the aviation community as well. Okay, amazing. So much to unpack there. To, to start with, um, I know some of our listeners will be familiar with, I guess, the challenges of working with hydrogen. But, you know, putting it simply, if, if you're not in aerospace, what, what are the challenges converting to hydrogen? Why is it difficult? Sure. I mean, hydrogen, uh, as mentioned, it's got great energy density, but it takes a lot of energy in order to compress it down. Um, it has a weird compressibility zone. It's a very small molecule and it wants to just expand to fill the space. Um, there are also certain concerns. They're not big safety concerns when we talk about it, but uh, there are certain concerns around explosivity and flammability that are you know, pretty standard with any other fuel, right? If we're talking about jet fuel, like those things are meant to combust as well. Um, but a lot of it is, is that in order to, uh, work with it, right? Like hydrogen has only traditionally been used in big industrial, uh, standards, or it's been used at the very cutting edge of aerospace, you know, back in the sixties when they were talking about doing, um, hydrox engines for, uh, rocket launches, et cetera. So this, the aviation market in particular is like a very odd, we'll say sizing case, right? Because everything that exists to deal with hydrogen is very big. It's bulky. It's meant to be on the ground. Um, but the technology is there, uh, right? So it's like kind of bringing in all the learnings that we've had about how to work with cryos from, you know, space, from industry, and really packaging in it and getting it in for aviation uses so that we can, work, you know, move towards the zero emissions future. Mm. And it's the, is it the fact that you have to keep it so cool? Is that why you can't, you know, just retrofit something into the wings? That's why you've got to move to a new solution? Correct. Yes. Um, a lot of it is, is uh, it has to be kept very cold. It's, I think, something like only 20 or 30 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. So that's quite cold. Um, it's <laughs> not impossible. Really challenging. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a refrigeration cycle that we know how to we know how to get there, right? Um, but then it's it's you need you know vacuum vessels. We know how to do that too. It's just we've never done a vacuum vessel that's particularly sized for an airplane and. Um, you know, there's a series of control valves and how do you vent the least and how do you insulate it, you know, as you said, thermodynamically, um, so that once you've spent the energy to compress it, it stays compressed and it only gets used when you actually need it. Um, it's being very okay, clever amazing. about when and where you, you place valves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was clearly, uh, there's loads of fascinating kind of problems to solve. Um, I think, you know, some people listening will have seen, you know, the amazing news recently, the flying demonstrators being kind of making headlines. So 
I guess I wanted to ask as well, the, my understanding of it is that the product initially is, is you know, converting the power plant and then further down the line, it's this modular hydrogen idea in other industries. Is that, is that kind of what the roadmap's looking like at the moment? I mean, ultimately, when we're talking in the next, we'll say, 10 years, like a decade, looking a little bit farther into the future, the golden standard is to have a hydrogen burning combustion turbine engine, right? That would be the gold standard, because really, that's that's a majority of the aviation market is a single aisle, you know, or wide body, too, if you if you want to count those. So the, the current market that we're looking at right now, those regional turboprops are a significant but a small portion of the aviation market. And so the roadmap mm-hmm. right now is in order to do the conversion, you have to have the, the liquid hydrogen modules and the hydrogen kind of uh, offtake agreement and the ecosystem to be there already. So that's that's kind of the game plan is those those are kind of all three aspects that we we're working on right now. The power plant conversion, the module development and also, you know, working with the honestly, the growing green hydrogen industry. OK, amazing. And um Specifically with relation to to the demonstrator, I guess a chance to speak more to your specific role and involvement at Universal Hydrogen. What's your, uh, wh- where do you fit in the organization? Let's say, what's your specialism? So my title is specifically, like you mentioned, it's a, a systems engineer. Um, and what that can mean is it's a little bit nebulous in a company that's only like 100, 120 people. Um, so the hats change every day, but mostly what my position has been, um, has been looking into integrating systems. So our demonstrator is a one meg- megawatt demonstrator. It's not the full uh, type certificate, but what it's there to do is to demonstrate that the architecture is, is sound, that our technology is sound. Um, and it's in the right power class, we'll say, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, an order of magnitude larger than current existing, uh, we'll say fuel cell systems on, you know, forklifts or cars or what have you. Um, so we're really getting into the correct scale um, with the demonstrator. So I was helping with integrating that and then moving on to the two megawatt product, which will be our, our certified product. So taking kind of the lessons learned that we have from the, the test bed, and then how do we move that and um, incorporate that into the, the two megawatt, um, as well as you know identifying if there's any particular risk mitigation, things like that, that we need to work into the, the test bed. Okay. I mean, it's it's amazing progress because I was looking as well at, at the timeline on the website and I mean, you folks have moved so quickly in, in, in a few years to go from kind of the company startup to flying demonstrator. I mean, what what's the secret sauce? Can you say? <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's, it's really controversial, but it, it's honestly, it's having the right mindset and the scope, right? The company has, was, you know, founded and has been led by we'll say aviation, really experienced aviation professionals. Um, and it also has like a good dose of folks who have who have worked in that space, but also want to improve it um, or ca- kind of have that startup mindset. So it's, you know, taking kind of, in my mind, the best of what we've learned from the industry and how we can best improve that. So it's really, you know, a lot of issues that I see on on engineering is not really a technology, uh, technological issue. It's more of an execution one. So it's, can you put the right team together? to to do these things and the answer is yes when you empower them and you give them resources you can you know kind of accomplish these crazy things um or it seems crazy right but it it really isn't yeah yeah (laughs) it looks like magic but it but but it's real it's really really impressive and you you mentioned briefly the industry i mean i've seen it reported in some circles that we're in almost a golden third generation of aviation we kind of had you know there was the piston the jet and now it's electrification and new fuels it's got really exciting time to be getting into the industry. I wonder if you had any reflections on the, I guess, this this new wave and kind of this innovation in aerospace companies that feels like in the last five years has really kind of bloomed and flourished. Sure. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, right? So when I started my career, oh, at this point, seven, eight years ago, you know, you, you look into the companies that exist, you look around at the industries and really where a lot of the market was, was in space. You, you know, I, I've always been interested in airplanes. I thought that'd be fascinating. But unfortunately, even eight years ago, the space was really narrow to, you know, those military projects to, to very specific things in a very specific industry where um, you're talking like very light sport craft or a couple of the commercial projects in terms of, you know, the one business jet that gets uh, commissioned and designed in, yeah. per decade. 
Um, so it, it was kind of like a limited space. And I feel like now there have been a lot of, you know, particularly in the eVTOL market, of course, um, but even beyond that, you know, there's been Boom Supersonic, there's been a lot of other, you know, Universal Hydrogen, um, Zeravia, there's been a ton of new companies popping up, Jet Zero, that are all about uh, kind of taking a new fresh look at aviation from a particularly small, uh, kind, of, kind of a smaller startup mindset. Yeah, yeah, and moving incredibly quickly, it's um, it's fascinating. I'm trying to obviously, I've got an aerospace bias myself, but it just seems like an especially exciting time to see all the innovation that's happening. And um, I could obviously ask you way more technical questions if we have time later. I might come back to some of the universal hydrogen, but I want to ask a bit more about your background as well, Tian. Um, and sure. so you graduated from Cornell um, in 2016, and Am I correct in you did a master's in systems engineering? That's right. That that is correct. Yes. So I, I was curious to know what um, what drew you into systems engineering as a discipline at, at that stage because I guess that was the start of your road to the role you're in today. Sure. Uh, yeah. So um, I'll probably have to back up a few years. Um, so prior to getting my take, systems take engineering, us, take us take us <laughs> down story lane, please. These are the best tangents. Um, so a couple of years before doing my uh, systems engineering degree, I was actually in the middle of a chemical engineering degree. It's a little bit removed, um, but I'd also gotten involved in my university's Cornell's uh, formula student team. And so the interesting thing about Cornell's formula student team is that it's actually one of the first. So it was one of the first like three or four founding teams that started the whole formula student thing, um, which I find oh, fascinating because... Wow. You would have thought that Formula Student would have started in Europe, but it actually started in the States uh, back when we still had you know, a couple know of, <laughs> yeah, back when we still had a couple of Formula circuits around um, in, in what feels like the era of a cigar cars, but not quite that old. It, it was back in the 80s. Um, so I got, I got pretty involved in that. So Formula Student, for those who don't know, is an open wheel uh, race car. There's differing levels of how much is kind of student built or student owned but it, the sky's the limit for that project. So the whole thing can be completely custom. Um, Cornell's team was pretty large. So we did quite a bit of work on both the powertrain. So I was, you know, powertrain lead and uh, kind of while, while I was there, I saw the need for systems and chemical engineering as a whole is kind of a very systems based, uh, the way that they train you at Cornell anyway, is to look at everything as, as a bound system, right? You know, things come in, they got to go out. It's an equilibrium thermally, um, mass wise, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always been kind of interested in that kind of systems thought and and processes really, because everything's a process that can be balanced or optimized. Um, but that formula project really got me interested in, in kind of more uh, transport hardware, <laughs> we'll say. Um, you know, big industrial plants are amazing. They're kind of the alchemical factories of our time. They change one su substance into another. Um, but there is something to be said about uh, how that industry is in terms of, you know, sustainability and environmental and like where you can take your career in those uh, senses and and uh, where the technology is going. Right. Like you're either very much in a lab and then you're going out and applying those lab that lab data to a giant industrial fair. Um, aerospace kind of offered me a little bit more of a. Uh, we'll say quicker turnaround in terms of projects, because big infrastructure projects like what universal hydrogen is trying to avoid can take decades. Um, yeah. So systems, <laughs> systems engineering has always been of interest to me, right? It's, it's fascinating to me that we can take all of these concepts and all of these oftentimes thousands of people's of effort into these kind of insane projects and tasks, you know, way more than the sum of its parts. Okay, amazing. So you got the that was the you got the the flavor for systems engineering. You then able to specialize in your masters, and then it was I guess you know straight in at the deep end, um, in that you joined Lockheed, which I guess you know very famous name in aerospace, hugely reputable, um, quite I guess you know old school, you know coming from someone who's a Rolls yeah. Royce kind of big <laughs> industrial complex, uh, and yes. you know I know what that feels like. So you were at Lockheed, and then um, after being there for for a few years, moved moved on to Boom Aerospace, mm -hmm. uh, bringing back kind of supersonic jets. Was that a culture shock? Was there a transition period there? Um, it was a bit of a a change, but not so much as a shock as it was something I was looking for at the time, right? Like I mm -hmm. I had gone to Lockheed with what I'd hoped with my was my eyes open, right? I knew it was a little bit of a different, you know, 
uh, very different than what I'd been doing in university um, with the formula team. And, but what I learned there was very valuable, right? Because there's, you're talking about decades and, you know, centuries, if we're going to be cumulative of engineering experience at those places and their, their test facilities, particularly at the space facility as some of the weirdest like test chambers that you've never heard of. You're like, Oh, this is the only 40 by 40 foot, you know, anechoic chamber, spherical anechoic chamber in the world that can test, you know, like a geo, a geostationary satellite bus. <laughs> Like that's cool. <laughs> 40, forty foot, forty foot, and a coat. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to visualize. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, there was like a you know, ten or twelve meter by ten or twelve meter uh, thermal box, and like that was large enough to put our largest antenna into. Um, there were acoustic chambers that were big enough to to take a whole spacecraft, and like that. Okay. Wow. That is very odd, and it was certainly an experience to go to those facilities and, you know, like talk to the people who are running them and look at what a test plan looks like when you're, you know, testing a geostationary satellite. Um, but moving, moving to boom was certainly that change in pace that I really craved. Right. So like, mm -hmm. you know, there's always the trade-off centuries of experience, but also maybe some of the inbuilt um, bureaucracy that kind of makes its way into the process at those kinds of places, as I'm sure, you know, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very aware. <laughs> and was I mean, it's an interesting point that because I think some of these issues do emerge in the more kind of traditional companies. I'm interested in you know when you went to Boom, did you see them being being addressed well? Kind of a different tack. And I guess same question for Universal Hydrogen. Mm -hmm. I would say it, it's it's always addressed. I think, and this is one of the big things with an attitude towards this can change and this can be better, right? Do I wish that there was sometimes a little bit more like experience in terms of, okay, like, so we know, we know that this, how this process looks like it and say, we'll say in a more established company, what can we trim from this? What works, what doesn't? Um, sometimes the process can be more along the lines of, because you tend to be a little bit more understaffed at a startup because you're doing so many things. It's what can I place that's the highest value in the little, <laughs> in the least amount of time um, as fast as possible so that I can actually get value out of it. So it doesn't always lead towards, let's say a plan system. Um, but it's certainly a much past, faster paced system. And that's, you know, I, I do think that's the thing that I enjoy, right? That there's less time spent, you know, talking about something and more time spent doing it. Right. Yeah. 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 Which is kind of, yeah, exactly what you want to kind of progress through the, um, Coming back to then, so some time at Lockheed, I guess, experiencing the big, I guess, industrial complex, but some amazing facilities and through to mm -hmm. boom to now Universal Hydrogen. Do you feel like you've been able to pick up the, the the best of both worlds in terms of the kind of the epic testing and, you know, the realities of real product versus the agility that you get from a smaller organization? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I hope, right? Like, and again, I, I go back to why Universal Hydrogen has been so successful in its execution is kind of having some of that experience to dictate, okay, these things are important. And then because you're a startup, we can get them done fast. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. even something as simple as the switch to flow engineering, right? Like that would have taken a whole quarter worth of meetings and so much budget approval. And I think we did that within like a few weeks once we did an evaluation. Okay, gosh, it, that is... That is speed I can only dream of. <laughs> yeah. Um, since, since you mentioned it, I mean, why you've obviously got, you know, a few options to choose from. What was it that led you to to pick Flow to run with? Um, so having come out of places like Lockheed and been at other places like Boom and, and Virgin Orbit. So I'd, I'd kind of seen the space in terms of tools that people reach for when they start saying, okay, now is the time to kind of implement requirements, right? And Obviously, you have the, the big old doors, you know, IBM, doors next gen, if you want to go there. So there's there's that. And that's actually a very common, um, I've seen a lot of places take uh, terminology and, and take some aspects of the doors architecture into their own kind of homebrews. Um, I've also seen places reach for things like JAMA, which is, you know, at least cloud-based. It's, it's a little bit more collaborative. Um, there are things like Airtable, which is, you know, again, a collaborative but not quite, I don't think it was really meant for requirements engineering in terms of a hardware sense, right? Like more, maybe perhaps more of a software sense. And then, mm -hmm. you know, right on down to the good old, you know, Excel spreadsheets, Google Sheets, 
Um, Which we all edits. know and love. We've had it. We, 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 yeah. We've opined by Excel on, on this podcast. <laughs> yes. Um, it's just one of those things where you, at some point you start with, with Excel or spreadsheets because that's the easiest thing to do and it's the quickest and it can get you those results fast. And then at some point you always have to make the, the jump. But um, Flow really appealed because they were kind of the newer, the new guy on the block that was doing the things you know, JAMA was just so hard to get new users, users into. Mm-hmm. Needless to say, anything of doors, right? And then you're talking about cost per licenses and the way that those licenses are structured. It's not very conducive towards smaller companies, right? Um, I, mm-hmm. I completely get why they have, you know, their certain license structure for larger places or, you know, when they're carrying a lot of data for those places. But when you're a smaller company, right, and you're not using 100% of those perhaps very particular artifacting and you're not producing you know, gigabyte, gigabytes of data to give to, you know, certification or uh, audit bodies, then maybe you're not getting the full value out of it. So Flow really hit that niche of, you know, like it's it's worlds ahead of something like a Google Sheets or a spreadsheet, um, even something like an Airtable where you can start to get those links. Um, but mm. so- And how, how important, sorry, sorry, I interrupted. No, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask you, you, you touched on it slightly, you know, universal hydrogen has to move quickly. How important is the ability for people to pick up the tool and, and be running with it quickly? I mean, that's, I, I think that's pretty paramount to how, whether, whether or not a tool survives and is used at a startup, right? It startup time, you know, that time is just that much more valuable um, to the point where if you, you know, even if a, a solution is, we'll say structurally superior, if you can't get people using it quick, quickly enough, if you can't get it to insert its value into the into your process as quickly as you need to, to like actually bring value to. And when you have a design process that is five to 10 years, you have two years to get that system into place. That's fine to teach everyone and to you know, output all these documents, but you know, time is of the essence at a startup. So um, really getting those users on board and getting them to see the value uh, really quickly is, is so, so important. Yeah, allowing uh, letting engineers do the actual engineering. That again is is, is a common theme right. that you know we want tools to be useful. We don't want to spend time picking them up to learn the syntax or how to actually run the thing. Um, yeah, the, so true. The lower you, the learning curve is so important, and I'm sure you've seen that too with like any sort of analysis tool. It's like this analysis tool is amazing once you've spent three months learning it. It's like, I don't, yes, I don't yeah. Once you've time. been on the training course and done all yeah. the yeah, the, the specialist stuff, and by that point, you know the project's halfway through. Yeah, no, totally been there. Universal Hydrogen is particularly interesting because you you've got a split um, engineering base, as I understand it, between um, California and Toulouse o- over in France. So does that mm-hmm. introduce? Well, both I, I guess in in time zone, but also you know how do you collaborate effectively over that distance? Um, there are certain kind of working methods that we've, we've fallen into or working patterns, we'll say. So the time zone difference is, is pretty rough, right? I, you're pretty close being in London. <laughs> I think that's an eight yeah. hour difference. <laughs> so nine hours is, is just around that cusp of when we have about a couple of hours in the West coast morning and a couple of hours in the, um, central European evening and French mm-hmm. evening to which to, with which we can collaborate. So like those hours are super important and we have to be very protective of those times. Um, We've also just found that, you know, the occasional exchanging engineers, you know, it it really works well, right? Like we we live in an era where you can do uh, so many things by Zoom, so many things virtually by phone call. Um, But having those one or two introductory meetings to actually learn who the people that you're working with are can be super important. So, you know, that's certainly leveraged. but yeah, I mean, I, I think we've just really, uh, and it's taken some time as with anything, developed kind of like a mm. back and forth process of this is what, you know, the, the European Design Center does. This is what the LA office is responsible for. This is the way that we interact with each other. Um, and it seems like there's a lot of uh, professional experience with working kind of in these international groups, which is has been new for me, um, right? Working in space, oftentimes these things are, ITAR um, or export control. Yeah. So Fire I can world. only, <laughs> yeah, so I can only ever work with Americans and American time zones, you know, can't take my laptop outside of the States, things like that. So it's been a pretty fascinating experience for me to, to kind of see how, how you work in an international company. Mm. 
So those, I mean, I guess those having having those two clusters of teams making sure that you're using those R's effectively and are pulling in the same direction. Because I guess it could be very easy to have, you know, two two groups of, you know, opinion or technical grouping, but you've all got to really be shooting in the same direction. Yeah, I, I will say it, the the having the two headquarters definitely makes issues like that a lot more clear, right? Like I think those things can be a little bit more insidious when you have maybe one building and you have two groups that don't talk to each other, but you don't have to really address it because they're physically next to each other. Um, here, it's like you if there's a problem, you see it very quickly. And so it has to be fixed quickly. Uh, again, yes. the sort of thing where you can't just let it sit there just because it's like, uh, it sort of works because you're in the same building. Um, there's no, France, no simmering. <laughs> yeah, there's Quiet there's simmering. no way to avoid these things and, and to just, you know, kind of sweep it under the rug. So that's actually been kind of a, also another interesting uh, uh, kind of aspect of that working relationship is like, it has to be addressed, right? Like if it's not working, we got to make it work. Yeah, um, so I think we're, we're talking a, about... The- Sorry, I sorry, just, I think we're, I've got a slight delay. Please finish the point. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I think we've gotten to a good working rhythm now, um, especially as we move uh, more towards into our two megawatt product. And you, it's just made me think, talking about that international collaboration as well, You and this is my aerospace background coming through, is that you've got to, I guess, there's two demonstrator aircraft that are happening, and one is kind of the the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, and the other, the European EASA. Um, and I guess you're having to juggle both of those. Uh, I don't know how much you can speak to the the challenges that that presents, or if it's a bird to, if it's a chance to, you know, two birds with one stone. <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to ask about those particular plans, uh, at least on the UH2 side. <laughs> Okay. 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 It's, um, I mean, it's fascinating to me. Uh, I encourage everybody. There's lots of exciting news that's coming out at the moment as well. Um, so I guess, you know, looking forward to, you know, universal hydrogen and where you're going, what are you kind of excited to see in the next few years? Cause I guess kind of product is on the, is on the horizon. Is that, is that the big North star at the moment? I mean, it, it is. And I think that's kind of the case with, uh, uh, any, kind of hardware startup, right? Like you need to have a viable product as soon as possible. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking forward to uh, the certification project for sure. Um, but we're also keeping, I think I can speak a little bit to this, but we are we are keeping our flight test bed, you know, moving, right? There's interest in, in learning more of that and keeping that alive for as long as possible. I know some startups will, you know, have a demonstrator and then like gets tabled and it's like on to the next new thing. Um, we're going to keep flying. So I, I'm looking forward to just seeing it, you know, uh, Lightning McLean, that's our one megawatt Dash 8 Q300 Great demonstrator. <laughs> Shout out to... Who, uh, I was going to ask who came up with it. Can you say? <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, she's actually left the company at this point um, for personal reasons, but shout out to Mackenzie Kinsbach for, for that name. She won the naming contest and it was... Uh, Although the name uh, Nemo also came in pretty close because if you look at the propeller sizes, the right propeller is definitely smaller than the left propeller, um, which was true for Nemo the clown. I mean, initially, as well. I thought it was going to be because, you know, hydrogen was invisible, that it was, you know, it's going to be hard to find or something. <laughs> I was overthinking it clearly. Um, well, that's amazing. And also, I mean, the other thing I've been struck by is, and I think this speaks to this new generation of aerospace companies as well, is you're sort of testing out in the open. You know, I've seen loads of kind of video content and stuff online in the public domain about how the testing is going, which mm-hmm. again feels very different to that historic mindset of it's all, you know, firewalled behind closed doors. But sure. it feels like you're really kind of inviting people in on the journey. Yeah, I'd say that's a big difference between something that's maybe military or defense um, and something that's purely commercial. Right. So because it's commercial, you don't have the typical, as you said, firewall of the ITAR uh, import export control things on it. Um, I think we also have less to hide in terms of our execution. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want to fudge how much progress you've made just because if you have uncertainties in your schedule or you have some doubts about how you're going to hit certain dates. And I I don't think there's as much fear of that. Right. Like um, particularly in the startup space, it's like we invite you along with us to, you know, move things forward. And that's something that I particularly enjoy, right? Um, It's not this closed door like, oh, you know, Lockheed or Boeing or whoever 
has known this for the last 30 years, but only the people who've been at Boeing Lockheed for the last 30 years know that, right? Um, I think it's way more conducive for technology and science if we talk about these things. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to Absolutely. see uh, people get excited about hydrogen. And I mean, on, on hydrogen, um, it's a funny one because I feel, what do you think is the biggest misconception people have about hydrogen? Because I think there's a lot of opinion out, out there and I think sometimes some sort of bad science. What is, you know, if you could set the record straight on something that you really would like to hammer home, um, is there something that really is, you know, a bee in your bonnet that you see being repeated that you want to put the record straight on? I mean, the easy one is everyone always talks about the Hindenburg. Um, but I, oh, I think yeah. it's <laughs> the H word that we don't talk about. <laughs> it's it's just so silly to me because it's like we don't talk about the Titanic when we talk about cruise ships anymore, do we? Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've moved on. No, but I, I think maybe the biggest, the most salient industry topic nowadays is people have a lot of doubts around um, our ability to to handle a cryo, a cryogenic fluid. And it's mm. like, it's, we've been using hydrogen at some at some very cold temperatures, um, maybe not fully cryogenic, to cool things like turbines, steam turbines in the industrial space. Um, we've come a long, long way from the 60s when we didn't really know what we were working with. And there are a lot of lessons learned. And I, I think people forget that, right? Like in 60 years, we've made enormous um, jumps in technology. We can mm -hmm. we can certainly apply those and take what we've learned. Just because it's new to aviation doesn't mean it's new to our kind of technological base as a species or as, you know, as a science. So I, I appreciate people's concerns about it being a cryogenic liquid, but like the math is there if you if you go into it and work out, you know, how much energy does it take to generate green hydrogen? How much energy does it take to compress? What are the transfer losses, you know, electrically and uh, chemically when you put it through the whole system? And it turns out it's it's a pretty darn compelling um, argument. <laughs> like the math yeah, is simply yeah, yeah. there. And I, I don't understand when people uh, kind of naysay it and they're like batteries. And I'm like, the math isn't there for batteries right now. Like if you were to just take existing battery technology, the power to weight density is not there for something as weight sensitive as aerospace. It, mm -hmm. um, or at least we'll say general use aerospace, like maybe in some very specific cargo, like last mile delivery, it makes sense. But that's, that's the one thing I'd like to put to rest is that these aren't competing technologies. We need to explore every avenue for taking a look at, you know, zero emissions in aviation and sustainability. Um, and there's no reason not to try. Yeah, absolutely. It's such an exciting time. Um, we like to ask everybody um, this question, and it's a bit of a provocative one, but it always it, it gets the cogs worrying is, you know, if you were to have universal hydrogen now versus if universal hydrogen was set up 30 years ago, is the would the approach be the same or has something fundamentally enabling changed in that time to allow universal hydrogen to be, you know, of the moment? Um, this is definitely a personal opinion, uh, not necessarily a company line. Um, but in That's my okay. opinion, That's okay. <laughs> in my opinion, I, I really do think that 30 years ago, where were we? Let me think about this. We were in the nineties. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that this particular point in time, it has been made very clear that, uh, climate change, you know, human, uh, human caused or not climate change is happening. And I think we now have you know, a, a majority of the human race agrees with that. You know, there might be quibbling about how and when it happens, how, how to best define it, but climate change is first and foremost among, like amongst people's view. That's not something that existed in the nineties, right? Heard about climate change mm -hmm. as a kid, not sure that many people were very worried about it back then. Um, so that's a big one. Um, the other thing I would say too, is that aviation as an industry has really gotten to a point where they have scraped out all of the gains in a typical combustion subsonic airframe, right? So if you talk about kind of the exciting times in aviation, we'd say that's maybe between the fifties to the seventies, like really when they were just doing the crazy, there was money to do the craziest things in aviation. The weird, like you could dream up the weirdest aircraft ever and someone somewhere would give you the money to build it. Um, and then kind of as, <laughs> as aviation commercialized, commercialized and they were like, oh, we can actually make, you know, quite a bit of profit from this. To me, the industry um, started to stagnate, right? It, or it, it started to get mature. Um, so I, I think personally, the aviation industry is at a stage right now where people are looking for, hey, are there things that we can revisit? Supersonic travel, hypersonic travel, 
um, blended wing bodies, you know, mm. uh, new and other methods of combustion and thrust. Uh, those are all super exciting things to me. And I think it's because we've, we've really gotten to the top of that maturity tree on aviation technology that we're in the current uh, sphere of aviation technology, right? Like those subsonic uh, fuselage wing bodies um, running on combustion engines that we're really looking outward towards, you know, newer things. So I think that's super exciting. Yeah, it's time to re-examine. Uh, I totally agree with your point that there's, if you, uh, I would recommend anybody listening if you're interested, the NASA report server for kind of the 60s through the 80s is is a glorious mine of all sorts of studies, which is really interesting reading um, yeah. for those who are interested. Um, but I, I think you're right in that, you know, we're squeezing, um, you know, fundamentally big picture aircraft haven't really, you know, changed what they what they look like in terms of most of the insides as well for the last 60 years. And we're kind of squeezing those marginal gains. So everyone's looking for for where that step change is going to come from. Um, always like to finish on a, an optimistic note. And, you know, what you what you folks are doing is amazing, following it with real interest. What, and it could be universal hydrogen or outside, what are you excited for in the future of engineering? What gets you up in the morning? What are you really hyped for? Um, I've honestly been inspired, especially coming into Universal Hydrogen and seeing how many of, we'll say my peers and other people are just excited about kind of the future of sustainability in engineering and technology. Mm. Um, right. There's, I think, been a little bit of a change towards what's the craziest sci-fi thing that I can make to what's the craziest sci-fi thing that I can make that also won't wreck the environment. <laughs> Right. There's been a lot of care. <laughs> There's a lot of care and attention being paid towards these things. And that's I think that's, you know, super, super good to see. Right. Like people are paying attention. People are listening. They want to use their intelligence. And, you know, just like me, they want to build things that are good for hopefully multiple, multiple future generations of uh, humanity. So that's, you know, yeah, definitely a positive. That's that. That's what help gets you up in the morning. And I'm yeah. just uh, to, to finish on what can we and as much again as much as you can say. What should we be keeping our eyes for? You know, universal hydrogen as we come to the end of this year, start of next. Is there anything really exciting we should be keeping our eyes for, or is it just a case of stay tuned? Uh, I think you can. Well, for anyone in the California area, uh, definitely keep your eyes open for news about our test bed going around. Um, that's always exciting to me. The Mojave airspace is, has just been a kind of a historic one in terms of experimental aircraft and spacecraft. And it's been an honor to join kind of that, that uh, list of, we'll say, very notable uh, aircraft. So we're continuing flight test. Um, hopefully, if you're around the area, maybe, <laughs> maybe you'll see us flying. Maybe you'll see just the water vapor coming out of our <laughs> right-hand engine. It's, it's honestly, it's pretty crazy to just see that it's just... Um, water vapor and the other side you know the the original pratt and whitney is still belching out smog and diesel smoke so <laughs> it's a real a real ch chalk and cheese when you see it yeah um yeah we're looking forward well if there's ever one that um happens to be coming from toulouse over to the uk <laughs> then i should keep my eyes peeled i'm not going to be in california anytime soon but um mm. best of luck in the meantime and uh thank you so much for joining us tian on beyond blueprints really looking forward to seeing where Universal Hydrogen goes, and uh, yeah, best of luck. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here and speaking with you. Thanks very much. All right.